Okay, today I'm going to be talking to you about hydration and how hydration can affect your blood sugar levels and your insulin sensitivity. Now there's lots of reasons why staying hydrated is really important for health reasons, but I bet you didn't really stop and think about how it can affect your blood sugars. So today, hopefully this will explain or will help clarify to you how um, this is the case, or why this is the case, and basically um, giving you a better understanding and hopefully encouraging you then to make sure you do make a bigger effort to stay hydrated. All right, so the first thing that can, or how uh, hydration affects your blood sugars is the simple act of dilution. So if you think about dilution, if you have two beakers here or two glasses and one has less volume or less liquid in it, and the other one has a greater volume or greater a greater amount of liquid in it, but the same number of blood of sorry glucose molecules. So there are three glucose molecules in this first um, container, and then there are three glucose molecules in the second container. So the concentration of this first one with less volume is going to be greater, whereas on, in the second container there is uh, the concentration will be less because there is greater volume and so this is exactly what happens in your blood to a certain degree so when you stay hydrated you have more liquid on board and your blood volume then is greater so if you have more blood on board that is liquid that is the volume then the um, your blood glucose concentrations will be less. And this doesn't mean that um, drinking tons and tons and tons of water is going to dilute your blood so much that your blood sugar levels go into the normal range and everything's fine. It doesn't quite work like that. There is a, you know, a maximum or there is a limit to how much water or fluid you should be drinking because you can drink too much fluid. So it's just really about staying hydrated and not getting dehydrated to ensure that um, you are, your blood concentrations aren't going up because of that. So dilution is the first thing, first reason for how, uh, how hydration can affect your blood sugars. And then the second one is due to a hormone called vasopressin, or also known as the antidiuretic hormone. So vasopressin or the antidiuretic hormone, I mean, as it implies, so when you are dehydrated or when you have low fluid intake, this stimulates the release of this hormone to basically, so I guess a diuretic is something that makes you wee out fluid and then obviously you're going to get dehydrated. So anti-diuretic means that it will prevent you or stop you from um, getting rid of fluid to help to try and keep you hydrated. So if you're dehydrated, or you're not getting much fluid intake, then vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone will be released to try and conserve as much water as possible. Now, how has this got anything, how is this related to your blood sugars and um, how does it all fit in? So hormones, hopefully by now you have a basic understanding of hormones. So hormones are messengers. And so, what happens is the hormone, a hormone will be released to have an effect and by, to have an effect it has to bind to receptors on particular cells. So like insulin will bind to receptors on cells to tell the cell to take up glucose, the vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone will bind to receptors and there are various receptors throughout the body to have a, a particular effect. And so the one that we've spoken about is 
what's given it its name, antidiuretic hormones, so it will act in the kidneys. So that's one receptor. But there are other receptors that we've only just recently sort of um, learnt about or discovered that explain how this hormone actually affects blood sugars. So basically what happens at the V1A receptor, which is one of the receptors we know about. So V1A, at the V1A receptor, and this receptor is all throughout the body. And what happens when it binds to this receptor is it promotes the conversion of glycogen to glucose in glucogenolysis. So glycogen is the storage hormone, uh, storage molecule of glucose. So glucose is stored in the body, in your liver and in your muscles as glycogen. So when we break glycogen down, it breaks off into glucose molecules. And so this basically is a way to increase your blood sugar levels if you need them. So for example, when you're going for a run, you are going to use up some of the glycogen stores um, in your muscles for the energy you need to go for that run. So when the V1A receptor is stimulated, it can promote or stimulate glycogen breakdown into glucose. And it can also stimulate a process called gluconeogenesis, where basically other substrates that are available, like proteins and fats, are also turned into glucose. So... <clears throat> So the overall effect is going to be a rise in your blood glucose levels. So that's a V1A receptor. Then there is a V1B receptor. And at the V1B receptor, when this is stimulated, it stimulates the HPA axis. So what is the HPA axis? The HPA axis is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And this is also known as the sort of stress response. So that fight or flight response in the body. Um, and that is when the adrenal, the HPA axis is stimulated. So being dehydrated is a mild form of stress. So what happens is the hypothalamus, which is a, a small area in the brain, the towards the base of the brain, and the hypothalamus is the master regulator. So it helps to regulate things like body temperature and hydration, hormone levels, and things like that. So when it senses that you're dehydrated, it will send uh, a message, and the message is via hormones. Um, so it will release the adrenocorticotropic releasing hormone. And that hormone will then go to the pituitary gland, which is just below the hypothalamus in the brain. And it will tell the pituitary gland to release the adrenocorticotropic hormone. And then this hormone goes to the adrenal glands uh, which are just above the kidneys, and it will stimulate the adrenal glands to release cortisol. And cortisol is the stress hormone. So cortisol works in opposition to insulin. So cortisol will increase blood sugars, And insulin will reduce so they work in opposition so insulin is basically telling the cells to take glucose up out of the blood so if the glucose is getting pulled out of the blood it's going to make your blood sugar levels go down, while cortisol does the opposite. It's actually going to put more glucose into the blood. So they work in opposition. So if your cortisol levels are elevated, it's going to make you slightly more insulin resistant. So the insulin is 
you know, it doesn't mean that you don't get any glucose in your cells if you need them, but it, it makes you a little bit more resistant to insulin's actions and it will make your blood sugar levels go up. So normally what would happen when the HBA axis is stimulated, so there'll be a, um, a stress, whatever the stress is, it'll send, um, trigger this response and release, cortisol will be released. But of course we don't want that to just continually be stimulated uh, or we'll start running into trouble. And so what happens then is cortisol, when it gets to a certain level, will feed back to the hypothalamus and it will switch it off. So we call this a negative feedback loop. So once the stress is resolved and um, the body then needs to go back to what we call homeostasis. So normally cortisol will say, all right, everything is fine. You can um, relax now. So it, it switches this off and then cortisol levels will go back to normal. Now, vasopressin actually overstimulates the HBA axis and it causes a little bit of resistance to this negative feedback loop so that the message doesn't quite get across as strongly. So the HBA axis is overstimulated, which means there's more cortisol than potentially necessary, which means that there's going to be a little bit more of this insulin resistance or a little bit, um, uh, the, your blood sugars are going to be elevated for slightly longer. So that is really a relatively recent finding and understanding um, of what's going on. It does get a little bit more complicated, um, but that is how the V1B receptor, um, when it's stimulated by vasopressin, how that can also contribute to elevated blood sugar levels. And there are also V1B receptors in the pancreas. So these receptors are also in the pancreas and you know that the pancreas is the organ that releases insulin. So it can also have a direct effect on how much insulin is actually released. And then of course you've got the, the V2 receptors which are in the kidneys. And these receptors are responsible for what it has its name for, what it's essentially named after, so the antidiuretic effect. So it will uh, tell the kidneys to hold on to water to try and prevent you from losing fluid to stay as hydrated as possible. Um, so that doesn't really fit into the blood sugars so much as, uh, I mean, that's what we thought it was the main role of vasopressin was, but now we're understanding it has all these other effects as well. Now, we can't exactly measure vasopressin levels because vasopressin is broken down very quickly in the body. So it doesn't hang around for very long. So it's hard to take a measurement of vasopressin, but there is a biomarker that we can measure, which will give us a better indication. So vasopressin Vasopressin is joined to these two other molecules called neuro, neuropsin, I think that's what it's called, 2 and copeptin. So vasopressin is not very stable. It's rapidly degraded in your body. Um, but copeptin is relatively stable. So it will actually hang around for longer. So if we want to know relative vasopressin level, then we can test copeptin or we can get a, a measurement of copeptin because when a vasopressin molecule is released um, when we uh, yeah when it's released it has to be cleaved from these other two molecules so for every vasopressin molecule there will also be a copeptin molecule so if we measure copeptin then it will give us a an indication of the vasopressin levels now this isn't routinely done and doesn't mean that you need to go out and get this checked. You, you don't. 
there have been some studies showing that people with type 2 diabetes have slightly higher vasopressin levels. It gets a little bit more complicated and you know when we're talking about hormones and resistance yeah we don't need to go there today um, and really there's no need to be doing levels of copeptin. This is mainly done in studies um, to you know have something to measure. The main takeaway here is to stay hydrated. So this is all maybe a little bit complicated for some. Uh, hopefully you've been able to follow some of it and understand, you know, and take away some understanding. But at the end of the day, the takeaway message is to make sure that you stay hydrated. That doesn't mean drinking, you know, two or three liters of water all in one sitting, because if you do that, you're just going to pee it out. It's really about drinking about two or three liters for most people um, across the day and making sure that you don't get too dehydrated. So I hope this was interesting. I hope you found it helpful. Um, really only one takeaway message today. If you did, please make sure that you like it um, below, share it with friends or family if you think that they might find it interesting uh, and make sure you subscribe to my channel so you don't miss out on other upcoming videos. Okay, that's about it. Thank you.